God's process we're going through right now is. This is as serious as serious gets. I guarantee you 100 years from today, this is the only thing that will matter to you. Not your bank book, not your job, not the economy, not the presidential election, not your burdens about your family. This is it. Your salvation. If the Apostle Paul himself said, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. If Paul himself said, I fear that having preached to others, I myself would be disqualified. If Paul lived with the reality that at the end of the day, if his walk didn't match his talk, he didn't have it, no matter how many sinners' prayers he prayed. Okay. Paul said, at the end of the day, the proof's in the pudding. If my faith hasn't changed me, it hasn't saved me. Okay. Now back to John chapter 8. Let's bear up under what Jesus said to the true and false people in that passage. Genuine disciples abide in Jesus' words. Look at John 8, 31. Jesus said to the Jews, as he was saying these things, verse 30, many believed in him. So, he's like, oh, you're all in, huh? You're all in? Well, great. Verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. Well, that's great that you all believe in me. You all believe in me, do you? Well, how about this? If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. Time will tell. Do you abide in my word? The word abide means to remain or to continue. Are you remaining in God's word? Are you continuing in God's word? Salvation happens at a moment in time, but it's demonstrated over time. Got it? So, genuine disciples abide in Jesus' words. Jot this third thing down. And this is so key. Abiding leads to freedom. That's why he says, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That is the life of a Christian. If you really believe, you're going to abide in my words. And if you abide in my words, you're going to begin to know the truth. And guess what's going to happen? The truth is going to set you free. Day after day, week after week, month after month, there's going to be a growing pattern of freedom in your life. That's how you know you're saved, okay? You're abiding in His Word, and there's a growing pattern of freedom in your life. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jot these two words down, James. Free from what? Number one, power. Free from the power of sin. That's what he's talking about. Even when I want to do uh, what is right, what is best for me, what I know is, is for my own good, before Christ, I did the wrong. I wanted to do the right, I did the wrong. Now sometimes I still want to do the right, and I do the wrong. But more and more I, I want to do the right. I really do. And more and more I do choose the right. I'm not where I used to be. I'm not bothered by the truth. It's not an irritant to me. It's not an inconvenience to my agenda. More and more I'm getting free from the power of sin. Sin used to be able to say to me, do this, and I'd be like, okay. Now sin says to me, do this, and I'm like, I don't want to feel like that made me feel last time. I, I don't want that in my life. I want this is way better for me. And, and the power of sin is broken in my life. We've taught about that a lot from Romans 6. The power of sin, and then the pain of sin. The hurtful, destructive consequences of sin. When God says don't, He means don't hurt yourself. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. That's not something Pastor James says anymore. I know that myself. I don't want to suffer the consequences of choosing sin. I don't want to go back down that hallway again. I don't like it. It only makes me miserable. I've had enough of that. See, free from the power of sin and growing freedom from the pain of sin. You know, freedom is a word that's so misunderstood, isn't it? So many young people are clamoring for freedom as they do in every generation. See, we are free not when we can do what we feel will make us happy. That is not freedom. Freedom is not the ability to do what I feel will make me happy. Freedom is desiring to do what you should do. That's real freedom. And that's the growing pattern in the life of a believer. Not just do's and don'ts. I want to do the right thing. I want to. And, it is, it's, and, and, and what I want is right. I want the right and I want to do it freedom. Notice that Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will, shall 
set you free. And clearly there's a process implied there. And this is the part I want you to get. The text, because I just want to go through the text with you. I'm at verse 32 now. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now the text kind of goes back through those same points in reverse. Many people believe in Jesus. Genuine disciples abide in his words. Abiding leads to freedom. Now I'm on page two. False disciples don't recognize bondage. If you are saved, you're abiding in his word. You love his word more and more. And you're doing it increasingly. And it's leading to freedom. If you're not a true disciple, you're like bondage. Notice in verse 33, they answered him, we're the offspring of Abraham, which is hard for us to appreciate this, all right, but the Jews were so proud of their spiritual heritage. They're like, do you know who our daddy is? Do you have any idea who you're talking to? We are the spiritual elite of the universe, all right? We are descendants of Abraham. They were so offended. They answered him, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you can say you'll become free? Well, here's how. False disciples don't recognize their bondage. No awareness of personal sin or its hold on their life. You talk to an unsaved person and God's not really working in their life at this point. You point out to them their sin. They're like, what are you talking about? You get out of my face, man. I don't have no sin problem. It's not wrong what I'm doing. And they'll back you away. No awareness of personal sin. None at all. How can you say you will be free? They were insulted. Don't you know who you're talking to? And notice how Jesus responds in verse 34. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. What an interesting way of phrasing it. How gracious the Lord is. He says, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. So, question, uh, who commits sin? Lift up your voice. Who commits sin? Everyone. So when he says everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin, what's he really saying? Not only we're all sinners, but we're all slaves to sin. He's like, you say you've never been in bondage to anyone? Yeah, well, everyone's a slave of sin. Everyone. Except Jesus, he never sinned. He was God. But every human being, born in sin, chose to sin, all of us sinful, sinful people. And if that bothers you, you're like, I'm Abraham's descendant. I've never been in bondage to anyone. The Bible says it over and over. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. No perfect people here. No perfect, just forgiven people here at this church. No perfect people. Some have big sins. Some have little sins. Some people think their sins are big, but they're little. Some people think they're little, but they're big. False disciples, though, will not recognize this. Genuine disciples recognize their sinfulness. Jesus says, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. If you're a true disciple, you have a growing pattern of freedom. If you're a false disciple, you have some slavery in your life. You're slave to sin. So here's a little bondage checkup. Five questions to ask yourself. Number one, do you have a secret sin that is increasing its control on your life? By secret, I mean maybe no one even knows about it except for you. And instead of its control because all of us know what it's like to struggle with various temptations and sexuality and other things but here's the question I'm asking you not do you know about it but is it encroaching on your life or is freedom encroaching on its control is it getting better or worse are you getting free or more deeply into bondage because the people who are not truly saved are going deeper and deeper into bondage and the ones who are truly saved are going higher and higher and further and further into freedom so, do you have a secret sin that is increasing its control, its intensity in your life? Or do you have a story that's really the opposite of that? Number two, do you have a capacity to hold on to an offense? If someone slights you, if someone injures you, God forbid if someone abuses you emotionally or physically, do you have a capacity to hold on to that thing? I will not forget, and I will review this, and I will make you pay. That's a bondage. That's a bondage. And the disciples of Jesus, they're increasingly forgiving. And the false disciples, they're increasingly offended and bothered and angry. Find a false disciple in their 50s or 60s, angry, angry, bitter. What you did, you, you did me wrong. I will never forget it. That's not a true Christian. 
true Christian has a desire to reconcile. A true Christian is always holding out the olive branch. It might take me a day or a week or a month to get myself right after what happened, but I'm going to find a way to let go of that and give it to God, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. All right. Do you have a capacity to hold on to an offense or do you have a need to reconcile as truly saved people do? Number three. Do you have a reflex reaction to reminders about sin in your life? Okay, so you know when, when uh, if you had like a little sensitive spot, let's just imagine for a moment that you had had um, open heart surgery this week. And I didn't know it. And I was just like, hey, how's it going? And like every time I touched you, you're like, like that. Well, that would be very understandable. But do you know that, do you know that some people are like that spiritually? And, and coming to church becomes a really difficult thing for them because what happens is it might be happening to you right now and I, and I don't even know it. And you're like, uh, uh. Martha, get your things. We are out of here right now. Not, not a great sign. Not a great sign. And I'm not saying that I'm easy to listen to. God forgive me. All I'm saying is, is that the true disciples have a hunger for the truth. The truly saved. And the unsaved... Anything that just broaches their pride, they're like, get off of it! Like that. Okay? Number four. Do you find overt discussions about spiritual intensities disquieting or even aggravating? Do you find that if you're in a conversation and someone's like, I love the Lord so much, and wasn't that a blessing what happened here, and I'm just telling my brother about Christ and how he can change his life, and people start talking about the Lord, and you don't like it. Can we go back to the Cubs, please? Can, can we talk about the weather for a few minutes? Because you're really getting on my nerves over here. Do you know what I'm talking about? Not, not a great sign. Unsaved. I don't care how many cards you signed, how many times you've been baptized. I, I don't care. You're going to hear, I never knew you. If when the things of the Lord come up and you're like, get off of that. Last question. Do you battle a critical spirit toward people who appear devoted to Christ? Do you secretly, as I'm preaching God's Word, do you secretly, are, are you arguing with me right now? Are you just like, eh, no, eh, eh. He says, I don't know, Bible, I don't know. Are you arguing? Or when the worship team's up there singing, you're like, she's so phony, she's just up there for her own, she just wants it, he, I know, I, but there's people like that. You say, I, some of you are giving me this look like, are there really people like that? There really are. Not a good sign. False disciples don't even recognize bondage. Hopefully we've drawn a clear picture of that for you. And then this is the key. And it might happen to some this week. We'll call this message subtitled Operation Crowd Reduction. Okay? <laughs> because here's the fifth thing. False disciples don't remain in Christ. They just don't. You, say, you got a verse for that? Yes, I do. Verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever. Now, can you say, can you say that without your heart breaking? The slave will not remain in the house forever. The slave will eventually say, I've heard enough of this. I'm not going to go over there and have the, the, the pride turned over in my heart every week like some giant rototiller. I don't want it. The slave will not remain in the house forever. And some of you sadly are here without family members who will not be here because the slave will not remain in the house forever. Or 1 John says it this way, 1 John chapter 2, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had have been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out from us so that it might be manifest that they were not of us. And eventually what happens is, is that the false disciple eventually defects, walks away. And, and when it's someone in our family, we become so burdened and concerned for the person. But in reality, the true spiritual condition is being revealed. And there's grace even in that. If we don't try to uh, couch it with something else, if we tell it like it really is, not saved, not yet, not yet. Again, verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. Once saved, what? Always saved. Once saved, always saved. Say it. If you're truly saved, time will tell, we're, uh, we're going to watch, okay? And, and next time someone comes up to you and says, are you saved? Don't go, yeah, I am, I believe. Okay? That's like saying I'm in Cincinnati because I know how to get there. Okay? 
You know you're, you're saved through faith in Christ at a point in time. You know you're saved by the growing pattern of abiding in Jesus' words and knowing the truth that sets you free. No growing pattern, no assurance of salvation. False disciples don't remain in Christ. And by the way, I would just say this. You pray this for our church. This is one of the importances of strong biblical preaching. Because if you don't preach the truth, what happens? There's no reason to defect. If I'm just giving a lot of pop talks on felt needs and blah, 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 the false disciples, they don't leave. There's no reason to leave. He's talking about all the things that interest me. There are churches all around America and all around the world filled with tares. Filled with tares. There's no departing. There's no leaving. There's no, there's no need to do so. Because there's not enough truth there to even offend someone. Just a lot of pop psychology and shallow teaching that makes people feel good till Tuesday. It doesn't set you free. Many people believe in Jesus. Genuine disciples abide in His words. Abiding leads to freedom. False disciples don't even recognize bondage and they don't remain in Christ. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you will be truly free. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, how good that we could spend these moments together as a church family, gathered in various places, but one in spirit, one in commitment to your truth. Thank you for the good news of the gospel, that sins can be forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, right now I just want to pray for anyone here who has never come to know Him, whom to know is life eternal, who has never received the free gift of salvation through repentance and faith. If you're here and you're saying to yourself, you know, I'm not saved. Heaven would receive you in this moment. If you would just pray simply from your heart, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge the fact that I've broken your laws and I'm deserving your judgment. But I do believe that Jesus died to pay for my sin. And I do believe that he rose from the dead to prove that he is God. And right now I confess him as my Lord and Savior. The focus of this message though has been upon people who came in here already professing. But the truth is, is that you see an alarming gap between what you profess and what you're actually living. You've not been abiding in Jesus' words. There's not a growing pattern of freedom and righteousness in your life, and you know there's not. But you do love Christ, and you do want to live for Him. And so today, your decision is, I'm coming back to the focus of living for Jesus Christ. Not just resting in some eternal salvation promise, but living the life of a Christian as a way of, of evidencing what I profess. I want to give a, a, a truer demonstration of abiding in Jesus Christ and growing freedom. We want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Faith without works is dead. And we know that we cannot save ourselves. That is by grace alone, but as an offering of our gratitude for the salvation you have given. We want to live a life that is pleasing to you, holy. So help us, we pray. Give us strength to give a true demonstration of a life that is grateful for this great gift of salvation.